Good morning. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is John Renner and I'm the interim president and CEO here for Community Hospice. Uh, welcome to our Coping with the Holiday Workshop. Um, definitely wish that we could have uh, been together in person to do this today. However, as a result of COVID-19 and all these uncertain times, we wanna ensure we continue to do our part in maintaining the health and safety of our community members, but we are grateful to at least be able to offer this program virtually today. Community Hospice has been privileged to serve our community for more than 40 years. Our grief support services are not only for patients, families who have received hospice services, but are available to anyone in the community who has experienced a loss. Today, we will explore how to choose hope during the holiday season by finding joy after a loss. As I see many of the virtual participants that have joined us this morning, one of the many things that come to mind is each person is grieving the loss of a loved one. And many of you are preparing to experience your first holiday. So welcome, and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Our featured speaker today is Karina Castillo. Karina is a licensed clinical social worker with 25 years experience working in the field of social work, counseling, and hospice bereavement. She graduated from CSU Stanislaus with her bachelor's degree in sociology with a concentration in human services and a minor in criminal justice and also received her master's degree in social work. Karina primarily worked the first 15 years of her career at Child Protective Services and worked in the Family Reunification Unit. She also has worked at several nonprofit agencies providing mental health services to children, teens, adults, and families. In 2016, Karina began her work in hospice and was a medical social worker for several years. She came to community hospice in 2018 and is currently the Children's Grief Program Manager and Clinical Supervisor for our HOPE Counseling Program. Karina is happily married to her husband of 22 years, Robert. They have two beautiful children, Sophia and Lucas, as well as their Labradoodle, Blanco. Please join me in welcoming Mrs. Karina Castillo. Thank you so much, John, for that beautiful introduction. Um, and thank you for joining us at home, uh, those of you that are watching and joining us virtually. Um, I'd like to just uh, identify that we have decided that the Coping with the Holidays event this year, the title is Choosing Hope, Finding Joy After Loss. And I'd like to really start by um, acknowledging that grief is emotionally, physically, and spiritually painful. At times, this pain can seem unbearable. It is really a combination of many emotions that come and go, sometimes without warning. Grieving is the period with which we actively experience these emotions. How long and how difficult the grieving period may take depends on the relationship with the person who died, the circumstances of the death, and the situation of the survivors. The length of time people can grieve can be weeks, months, or even years. One thing that is certain is that grief does not follow a timetable, but it does ease over time. But death, sudden or expected, always brings sorrow and grief to the ones who are left behind. As we all know, death is inevitable. Rather than trying to avoid the feelings of grief, we invite you to lean into them. It's not the grief that we're trying to avoid, it's the pain that comes with grief. But grief is the way out of that pain. After a death loss, it is so difficult to find joy again. Joy in the small things in life, as well as in the larger things in life, such as the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, Ramadan, Kwanzaa, and New Year's can be very difficult holidays for people who have experienced a death. 
of a loved one. People struggle with the ideas of holidays and just don't know how to celebrate after such intense sorrow. Memories can serve as constant reminders of the loss. Watching others celebrate can be painful and even overwhelming. If you have had these types of thoughts, you are not alone. How do you know, I ask? You ask, let me share my story. This is my nephew, John Paul. John Paul was born on May 29, 1996, and was born to my sister-in-law, Maria, and brother-in-law, Robert. As a young child, John Paul was full of energy, curious, and loving. He was very bonded to his aunts and uncles, with whom he spent a lot of time with. John Paul was known for being a very bright child. He would score in the genius range on standardized tests at school. He was also known for his love of online gaming, anime, lightsabers, soft air guns, and camping. When he attended school, he enjoyed playing football and baseball, as well as the martial arts, specifically Kung Fu. John Paul graduated from Enox High School in 2014 and decided to attend Universal Technical Institute in Sacramento, where he further developed his interest and passion for cars. He graduated from UTI with honors and shortly after graduation began his work as a mechanic at Central Valley Nissan. He designed and built many different race cars. His pride and joy, though, was his Infiniti G35. In 2018, after a couple years of working as a mechanic, John Paul developed a hernia that was surgically removed in early 2019. Shortly after his surgery, he returned to work because in his mind, he was young, feeling better, and was just okay. Within a few weeks, however, he began having pain and discomfort in his lower abdominal and groin area. He attempted to just ignore his symptoms and would just not lift anything heavy. But by May 2019, he had constant pain that did not improve with over-the-counter medication. The pain was so intense that late one evening in May 2019, he went to the ER. That led to many follow-up visits with his doctor. And after many, many tests, they told him he had testicular cancer. In August 2019, John Paul began chemotherapy in attempts to fight stage three cancer. He had three rounds of chemotherapy to be exact. Unfortunately, on October 19, 2019, Cancer took his life. He was only 23 years old. As you can imagine, after such a tragic loss, our family was devastated. We had his funeral services in early 2019. We were surrounded by so many friends and so much family. Um, we even had a lot of people from Central Valley Nissan who joined us and wore their um, their work clothing and hats in support of their friend who had died. Shortly after that, the holiday season came. That year, Thanksgiving and Christmas were so difficult. They were like a blur. I do remember though, my teenage daughter uh, put together a short video on Thanksgiving day that year in his honor. It was her way of coping with a death loss of her cousin and to somehow still feel like we were including him that day. I would like to share that video with you now.
So although holidays are difficult, we must remember that as humans, we have an immense ability to cope with anything that life brings. It is true that we all have different level of coping, but today during this workshop, I would like to share seven basic universal steps to choosing hope and finding joy after a loss. Step one, identify your feelings and allow the feelings to flow. The death of someone you love will conjure all unimaginable emotions within you. Sorrow, regret, guilt, pain, grief, heartbreak, misery, anger, sadness, and many more. These feelings, um, sometimes we feel them all at once and they can be extremely difficult. It is quite normal, so let them flow. You do not need to suppress them. Cry all you want. With time and allowing grief to be released, it will become less painful. It is an important process that will help you in dealing with grief and accepting your loss. Feel the pain, do not resist it. Even give it precedence over other emotions and activities because grief, when it is repressed, it will later come back if it is ignored. Because grief has no timetable, it can also reoccur. So expect the emotions to come and go for weeks, months, and even years. While a showing of strength is admirable, it does not serve the purpose to express sadness, even when it comes out at unexpected times and places. In order to assist with feel, feeling identification as a grief counselor, I like to use this activity in working with my clients. It is called grief, a tangled ball of emotions. As you can see, it gives a variety of different words listed that might give you insight on what some of your stronger, stronger grief feelings are. For instance, some common feelings are anger and rage. Other common feelings include sadness and depression. After my nephew, John Paul died, I definitely felt denial, which is actually at the very center of this grief ball. Just couldn't believe that it was true. Just couldn't believe that he was gone. I also experienced some feelings of regret, not being able to spend more time with him while he was at the hospital. What are some of the grief feelings that you have experienced since the death of your loved one? maybe emptiness, disappointment, or even loneliness. Step two in choosing hope and finding joy after a loss is to understand the grieving process. Dealing with grief and bereavement is a process. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross outlined the five stages of grief in her book titled On Death and Dying. The five stages are denial, anger, depression, bargaining, and acceptance. Although many grief experts feel these stages are outdated, a common agreed upon theme is the idea that these stages do exist, but they're not necessarily experienced in order and some stages are revisited. If you do not choose acceptance by choosing not to forgive, if you need to or choosing to stay in denial, that it will, it will not allow you to break out of the grief web. Instead of talking more about the stages of grief though, I propose we focus a little more on the four tasks of grief. What are the four tasks you ask? To accept the reality of the loss. When we experience a major loss, there is always a sense that it has not happened. An important task in grieving is to come full face with the reality of what has happened, that your loved one is gone and will not return. Recall and relate your memories, the pleasant and even the unpleasant ones. Tell people what you need from them because often people misunderstand the needs of the grieving. Your memories will continue, but the pain will lessen over time and grief will eventually become more manageable. To adjust to an environment, 
without your loved one. This means different things for different people, depending on what their relationship was with the deceased and the various roles they played. Many grieving people resent or fear having to develop new skills and to take on roles that were maybe performed by their loved one. The emotions involved in letting go and in not having your person's love and support might be painful, but again, necessary to experience. By refusing to do so, you may become stuck in your grief process and unable to resolve your grief. Forgiveness. This is a really hard one for a lot of people, including myself. Forgiveness of yourself or of the person who died can be an important element in your healing process, such as in situations where your loved one died by suicide, homicide, suddenly, or may have had some type of unfinished business. To withdraw emotional energy and reinvest in other relationships. This does not mean going out and finding a new spouse, a surrogate son or mother. It does mean re-entering the stream of life without the deceased. You must rebuild your life in your own way to satisfy your social, emotional, spiritual, and practical needs by developing new or changed activities and relationships. This is not dishonoring the memory of your loved one. I repeat that. This is not dishonoring their memory. There are other people and things to be loved, and it doesn't mean that you love them any less. Step three in choosing hope, finding joy after loss is to talk about it when you can. Talking about the death of your loved one can be a way of remembering them and can help you understand what happened. It's really about processing what happened. It will give you an opportunity to start the healing process. Denying the death of a loved one can result in isolation and you pushing away your family and friends. Talk about your sorrow and take time to seek comfort in friends who will listen. Let them know you need to talk about your death. Talk about it as a family. And include children in those conversations. Here are a couple tips that I've identified when talking to children to keep in mind. For young children, provide honest and accurate information. When talking about death and dying, a good rule of thumb is to talk simply, honestly, and with love. Remember to get down at their level and find a quiet and calm place to talk. Use accurate words such as died and death when you speak about what happened, acknowledging the permanency of death. Use vocabulary they understand and really allow the children to be your guide. Children tend to handle things much better when adults are honest and they show them that they want to include them. For example, you could go through holiday decorations and talk to them about how they relate to your memories with your loved one. This will allow for an open conversation and to be able to share as a family, including children helps them stay connected in a way that is meaningful and beneficial to coping and healing. One thing that children begin to understand is that people may die, but their love for that person doesn't have to. Step four, in choosing hope and finding joy after a loss is to identify your support system. Coping with a loved one's death is never easy, especially if you're dealing with it alone. You don't have to do it alone. You need support coming from your family and friends so that you can find comfort and overcome grief. Sometimes when we're overwhelmed with those intense feelings of grief, we forget that there are people in our lives that care about us and want to support us. I really like this diagram because it helps us identify people in different areas of our life that can support us. For instance, after my nephew John Paul's death, I had a lot of coworkers that were very supportive. I had a neighbor that would bring us meals or desserts. 
comfort food, which was wonderful. Also, people within my faith community were supportive and kind, and they would pray for our family. Even my Labradoodle Blanco, of course, was of support to me. Who are the people in your life that can support you through your grieving process? Although your family and friends can be your greatest source of support for overcoming the death of a loved one, it is also recommended that you take advice from professional people when you find that all the emotions and pain are too hard to handle, just unbearable. Examples of when you might need some additional support are if you're unable to go to school or work, difficulties in other relationships, sleep problems, whether it's problems with falling asleep, staying asleep, or nightmares, increased health issues, some of the most commonly reported um, health issues with grief are around appetite, aches, pains, headaches, feelings of hopelessness, just not feeling like you can crawl out of that hole, withdrawing and just wanting to be by yourself, and of course, self-harm or suicidal thoughts or ideation. That brings us to step five in choosing hope. Finding joy after loss is to find healthy ways to cope. Coping skills are behaviors or actions that we must take to relieve stress and deal with, with a death loss. Unhealthy coping behaviors tend to feel good in the moment and may seem to offer relief from the problem. Healthy coping can often improve mood and decrease anxiety. Specifically, let's look at what coping skills we can use during the holidays that might be helpful. Because adults and children grieve differently, I have actually decided to make two different lists. So here is the first list. I think I actually skipped a slide. There we go, for adults. So for adults, the list that I came up with and things that helped me after my nephew, John Paul, died were talking, I'm sorry, taking a walk or a run, listening to music, specifically music that your loved one likes, maybe their favorite singer or band, um, songs that maybe just remind you in general about them. Creating a scrapbook or collage, using your loved one's pictures, knitting, crocheting, quilting, or sewing. People have gotten really creative with this one. And although I am not good at this particular coping skill, um, people have made beautiful quilts or teddy bears out of their loved one's clothing. And it's just beautiful art that's created in memory of their loved one. Maybe cooking or baking your loved one's favorite meal or dessert. Journaling or writing a letter to your loved one or planting a memory garden or tree in their honor. For children, this is the list that I've identified. Riding a bike, scooter, or skateboard. Anything that you can do that's physical can be helpful. Creating art, whether it's drawing, painting, coloring. They can do it in honor of their loved one or maybe just draw or create some type of art in memory, uh, regarding a memory that they have with their loved one. Playing a game maybe a board or card game that their loved one enjoyed. Playing a sport. What was your loved one's favorite sport? Cuddling or playing with a pet. Looking through pictures of past holidays with your loved one. And singing or dancing to your loved one's favorite song. Something to keep in mind with these coping skills is that they are not to be used as a way to avoid the grief but rather to lean into it. Do activities that allow you to kinetically process your grief, not run away from it. Step number six in choosing hope and finding joy after loss is to establish new traditions. 
being open to change and open to, open to changing your traditions can be so healing. Some tips for this step are start with small rituals. Tradition is something that binds families together and makes them feel safe, comfortable, and connected. Changing these traditions can be incredibly scary, especially after a passing of a loved one. You may be afraid that change means you're letting go or forgetting that person. But upholding major traditions can be difficult, especially after a recent loss. In that case, don't overlook the small family rituals. Maybe those weekly phone calls with mom while you're away at college or those weekly dinners at grandma's house are just as important as the big family celebrations. By focusing on these small connections with your family, you will be better equipped to handle larger scale events, such as the first holiday without your loved one. So start with something small. Take a break from your schedule and sit down to have coffee with dad, see a movie with your sister, or even pick up the phone and call mom. It is likely that they're experiencing grief as well and processing it together can be so helpful and healing. Those small rituals may not seem like a lot, but they're really the start of a stronger family bond. Accept that change is perfectly okay. If you decide to make changes in your family's traditions, keep in mind that it is okay. Change is a natural part of life and family traditions change all the time. I guarantee you that some, if not all, some of your family traditions have changed or tweaked over time. For instance, maybe your sister Martha moved across country or Grandpa Jose is now in a retirement home. Every tradition adapts to change and the changing dynamics of a family and their needs. While the adjustment of a family member passing may require a bigger transition, it is important to be open to the change and accept it for what it is. A new opportunity to create new family bonds and traditions. Think of change as an opportunity. It can be easy to view change in a negative light, knowing that the person won't be there this year. But instead of going into the holidays or family reunions and celebrations with a cloud over your head, Think of them as an opportunity to remember your loved one and celebrate his life, his or her life, with who knew them best. It will be difficult and unfamiliar at first, but it is also a chance to remind the family why you're really there. What brings your family together? If they had a favorite holiday, consider holding a memorial service during your celebration. Remember that traditions don't have to be perfect. It is understandable that after your family suffers a loss of a loved one, you want everything to be just perfect. No glitches. At the next Thanksgiving dinner, you want to prove yourself and to your family that you can still go on and function despite the loss that you have suffered. But keep in mind that your family event won't feel perfect because your loved one won't be there. And that's okay. Think back to some of your most memorable family events. Which one was more memorable? The time where the turkey was perfectly carved and everyone sat around in their dressiest clothes? Or the time that you had to order pizza because your dad tried to deep fry the turkey and caught it on fire? It is in those perfectly imperfect events that we create our most memorable memories. Building those memories and establishing those bonds will create a stronger and more secure environment to deal with the death loss. Don't ignore the absence. Sometimes when a loss occurs, it feels easier to pretend like nothing's changed but what seems like a good coping mechanism can easily turn into a big elephant in the middle of a room. There are a couple different ways that you can combat this. 
For example, if you're having a holiday dinner shortly after someone dies in the family, consider setting a place for them, incorporating their favorite dish or flower or releasing balloons in their memory. It is healthy to acknowledge the passing of a loved one and could be easier when in the company of family. It can bring up old memories of your loved one that can be talked about as part of the healing process. And the last tip is plan ahead and be prepared. I can't emphasize the importance of this one um, enough because as tough as it may be, it is important that you sit down and have a conversation with the family on how traditions may change after a loved one's passing. By planning for these changes, you can help create realistic expectations, which can have really a positive impact on the whole family. They are more likely to have a more rational response if they have time to prepare and react to some of the changes. You won't be surprised when Aunt Angie's potato salad won't make an appearance at the next holiday because you've talked about it in advance. Maybe this year you plan to decide to have everyone make their favorite potato salad recipe and hold a taste test to decide who will be responsible for making it in future gatherings. Remember, everyone does this at their own pace. Do not force yourself because you think it's what you have to do within your first year. Next year, you can establish new traditions as well. This year can be about educating yourself on your grief and preparing. So back to my nephew, John Paul, and the upcoming holiday season for all of you and me as well. I have invited my good friend, Stacy, who is also a grief specialist here at Community Hospice, to help demonstrate the idea of establishing a new tradition by creating a memorial tablescape. Hi, everybody. My name is Stacy Reidenauer, and I am honored today to show you how to create a table in honor of the person you lost. So the first thing we're gonna do is get a table runner and I chose to do white because at the end of this project, we are going to be writing little messages on the runner. So the first step is laying out your table runner as we did here. And we are going to start to put some decor in the middle. And then at the end, we will um, have all of our friends and family write little messages um, of their favorite memory with their special person. So next, we're going to use our greenery, and you're going to place this in the middle. And you're going to try not to show the branches. So we're just going to hide them. Just like that. Okay, so next we are going to use some pumpkins. Um, for Thanksgiving, you can do pumpkins. We're going to use some succulents. For Christmas, you can use some bulbs. You can even put some lights in between. Um, so we're going to go ahead and start with the pumpkins. There's some succulents. So we're gonna go ahead and start with that first. So the next step is getting some pictures that I framed of people that I have lost. And we're gonna go ahead and place them in um, the center here. So we'll start maybe some on the outside. And you can even do some on the inside as well. Let's 
So um, we're almost done, but our final touch would be using some candles. And for safety reasons with the kids running around, we wanna make sure that we use the battery operated ones. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and put one here and one on the other side. And then you could turn on your candles and they flicker just like real candles. And another touch that you could use, um, I did get some iron-ons and these are doves, they're gold doves, and it would be a nice little sentiment maybe to put them on each end of your table, but that's just an option. And any of this stuff you could find at your local hobby store. So um, yeah, that's just a great place to find all your decor. So the last thing is um, I did get a fabric pin from one of our local stores. And um, this will let your family and friends write little um, special memories or whatever they want to write to their special person who um, passed away. And um, another reason for this table is um, a lot of times during the holidays, people want to talk about their loved one, but it is very difficult. So this is kind of like a conversation starter and letting people know that it's okay to talk about their loved ones during the holidays. And um, it's just a good way to remember all the happy memories. Thank you so much for letting me share my table and my loved ones. I hope this gives you some ideas for your table and I wish you all the best in your holidays to come. So I have to say, I just love the idea of establishing this new tradition in honor of my nephew, John Paul. I plan to create a memorial tablescape for our family for Thanksgiving this year. Here are some of the things that I gathered um, to use for my tablescape. As you can see, I will be adding some of my favorite pictures of him, some tools because he was a mechanic. We will also be adding some camping and car decals. And then we will also um, add a gaming controller since he was an avid um, gamer. And I feel like this will really just allow us to um, encourage the children within our family to also write messages on the table runner. And it will allow us to have more meaningful conversations that will turn into a new tradition that will celebrate his life. And it can be really something our family can cherish for years to come. Thank you so much to my friend Stacy for demonstrating this beautiful memory activity. I am so grateful. And that brings us to our final and last step of choosing hope and finding joy after loss, which is to practice gratitude. With gratitude, people acknowledge the goodness in their life. Gratitude helps people feel more positive emotion, relish good experiences, and improve their health, as well as building those stronger relationships with each other and dealing with adversity. What are some of the benefits of practicing gratitude? It's actually a pretty long list. Increasing happiness and positive mood, more satisfaction with all areas of our life, less likely to burn out, better physical health, better sleep, less fatigue, and lower levels of cellular inflammation, greater resiliency to face other additional problems in life. And it really encourages the development of patience, humility, and wisdom. And of course, it strengthens relationships. Even though you need to mourn the death of your loved one, there comes a time when you need to turn away from the mourning toward a new stage of celebrating life again. This includes celebrating holidays and special events. Understanding that death is inevitable and that we will all die someday, will some will give you hope to hopefully spend more time with the ones that are left behind. Cry as much as you need to, but know that your family and friends are still there for you, ready to walk along life with you. 
celebrate the fact that you are living. During your holiday or Christmas dinner, make a list of things that you're grateful for. Here's the list that I found, and I just love it because it gives such a good variety of things to be grateful for from family and friends, from the clean air that we experience. Um, you would include children in this process as well. And so teachers would be in there and school, just a variety of different things that we can be grateful and thankful for. What are some of the things you're grateful for that you can think of? I'd like to take a couple minutes now to read this beautiful poem written by Darcy Sims. The title of the poem is, For That I Am Thankful. It doesn't seem to get any better, but it doesn't seem to get worse either. For that I am thankful. There are no more pictures to be taken, but there are memories to be cherished. For that I am thankful. There is a missing chair at the table, but the circle of family gathers close. For that, I am thankful. The turkey is small, but there is still stuffing. For that, I am thankful. The days are shorter, but the nights are softer. For that, I am thankful. The pain is still there, but it only lasts but it lasts only moments. For that, I am thankful. The room is still empty. The soul still aches, but the heart remembers. For that, I am thankful. The guests still come, the dishes pile up, but the dishwasher works. For that, I am thankful. The stillness remains but the sadness is smaller. For that, I am thankful. The moment is gone, but the love is forever. For that, I am blessed. For that, I am grateful. Love was once and still is a part of my being. For that, I am living. May your holidays and, spe and special days be filled, filled with reasons to be thankful. Having loved and having been loved is perhaps the most wondrous reason of all. Just some final thoughts that I'd like to share with you. Those we love can never be more than a thought away. For as long as there's a memory, they live in our hearts to stay. Those we love are always with us, no matter what. Grief can be so challenging when going through the holidays. You can and will get through the holidays because you took the brave step of joining us today. If you would like to learn more about community hospice grief support services or need to speak to someone, please call us at 209-578-6300. We are here to support you. This presentation and workshop was in memory of my nephew, John Paul, and in memory of all of those who you have lost your loved ones in this last year, in the last couple of years. I wish you all a good day and a joyful holiday season. Thank you so much for joining us.